Hello guys, welcome to the new episode of uh, Under Extracted. This time. Uh, it sounds a little bit better in Romania, I think, if you're calling subextras. It makes more sense somehow. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. All the terminology we used to have and we learned ourselves to make coffee was in English. So like everything I read about coffee was in English and when I tried to like translate it in Romanian, it was like the same word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here we have a different one, so. Yeah. But now we got this slang of coffee, like under and over. Yeah. And when you say to somebody, it's, this this shot is under. How is the, this one? The other customers that have no idea what we're talking about. So what the hell is that? <laughs> under, <laughs> over. But yeah, uh, this one is in English. Why? Because we have two gentlemen here with us. Um, pretty famous, both of them, but also amazing people. I met them uh, several years ago, and it was a joy uh, having them uh, here with us today. It is. It is. Um, so I'll make a little bit of the introduction because um, um, I met a couple of times, both of them. Um, I'll start with Cole because I know him for a long time. Uh, we met first time in um, Milan, I guess, or even earlier before. Uh, Cole Tarot coming from Canada, uh, barista champion of Canada for a couple of times. How many times? Two times. Two times, okay. Yeah. Uh, seen him in uh, Boston for the first time. Uh, then in some other competitions, it was a joy watching him there. Uh, Cole is uh, one of the most charismatic competitors I've ever seen, even if um, Sometimes he's not talking that much. He always <laughs> has a sense of humor that I love about him. Also, together with us, uh, his brother uh, Dave. Uh, Dave is um, entrepreneur, coach, and um, one maybe one day he will be a competitor. I don't know, but uh, uh, right now he's uh, mostly traveling around the world without, without his wife. <laughs> so, Help me. <laughs> <laughs> no worry, he, she's not watching this <laughs> for sure. Uh, we, it's a pleasure to have them here. And gentlemen, thank you for being part of this episode of um, this podcast. Um, how do you find Romania so far? How do you find the atmosphere around? You want to go first? Cluj. Yeah, I think I think Romania has been really nice. We've been saying it feels quite familiar to home in a lot of ways. So we're from Western Canada. There are cities called Calgary. Uh, the landscape throughout the city is very much like rolling hills, kind of prairies mm -hmm. and, and uh, somewhat dry, arid landscape. And uh, just from what we've seen here, or much the same yet. very much similar geographically. And then it's chilly outside. There's some snow, you know, in or, in or out of... Uh, the days that we've been here, so it feels like a familiar winter for us. Of course, people, architecture, cuisine is different, but uh, in a lot of ways, feels feels close to home. Mm -hmm. Pe yeah, people have been super friendly. It's uh, you know been a nice, I guess, seven, six days, seven yeah, days. Yeah, we're right on the week mark, I think. And uh, food's been excellent. Our hosts have been outstanding hey coffee's been good don't forget that Co <laughs> coffee has been very Only very good outside yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been very good uh, all of these days that we spent together uh, helping christian to get to the busan world championships i noticed that every guy from the roastery whatever whenever he's brewing something they were just passing cups of coffee to these gentlemen and waiting for their reaction yeah and it's so funny sometimes because as a guest, you have to accept. <laughs> so how, every how much coffee do you have these days? Like uh, more than you usually have. There's a or? few guys at the roastery that brew <laughs> really a lot strong, of cups yeah? in a day, and uh -huh. sometimes I feel like I'm getting tested. <laughs> you know, a, cup, a cup comes into my hand, and I'm kind of like, uh, "Is this good? Is this bad? What am I supposed That's to?" That's how think you find the limits. And, doesn't he? it's like a process where you yeah he wants to yourself. learn i want to learn too frankly <laughs> and some have been great some have been i think we're talking mostly about stefan <laughs> yeah <laughs> we, we knew that already so how was the time interval like about five minutes uh, another one or somewhere yeah, in maybe eight minutes eight minute, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. let's just tell the, to the people who are watching this uh, episode that uh, we have this opportunity to have these gentlemen uh, because uh, christian um, christy oltan uh, is getting ready for um, busan for world championships and uh, we have this week to 
put together uh, the routine for uh, this competition. Uh, probably the king of competitions. Do you think it's a proper name for a uh, barista? Was, uh, for me, as, at least, is, is the most important competition from the world of coffee. Yeah, I would agree. You? Most complex? Yeah, it's the most complex, I think. We don't want to offend anyone, but uh, they yeah. break competitors. Yeah, yeah. There's you know 15 minutes to present 12 drinks, and there's a lot of moving parts that other the a few of the other competitions maybe don't have. And you can think outside of the box a little bit more. So I, I think beyond that too, it's also got the biggest uh, platform um, volume of competitors. Yes, I think mm -hmm. in recent years. 40, 50, pre-pandemic, we were talking close to 60, the two years that, that we competed representing Canada, I think 58 and 59, 58 and 57. So, I mean, you got a third of the world's countries representing on the global stage, where I think Brewers' Cup is maybe the second biggest at high 30s in terms of representation. Yeah. So, uh, you don't need to offend anybody. I think by, by size, by scale, it, yeah. it mm -hmm. is... The biggest How do you explain this? Uh, why would you guys feel like uh, there's bigger representation in uh, the barista? Why? Why is that? Is the interest uh, bigger or like it, the reward? It's also the oldest. And it's also so the oldest. So this year will be the 24th year of the barista competition. I think Brewers Cup is maybe in like 14 ish. Mm -hmm, I don't know. Mm -hmm, I don't know mm -hmm. that for a fact, but I, it's still a young there. teen, where barista is. You know, an adult now. It's a living, breathing thing. We've seen a couple renditions of the platform. We've seen Dave and I have been competing since 2010. From when we oh, well. started to now, I mean, we feel like dinosaurs in a lot of ways. <laughs> like the, the whole thing has changed so much, quite substantially. Mm -hmm. And if you even go back 10 years before we got there, you had to serve sugar with your espresso. There's and judges, that, there's videos of judges smoking. Oh my God, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, competitors didn't talk about what the coffee was because single origin wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. Like you go through the history books of barista competition and it's a whole different game. And, you know, we're in the 24th year. We're going to see new innovations this year. It could be a big turning point that next year it's a whole different game again. And, and who knows? I think it's that's exciting. what makes it so exciting too. Yeah. yeah. Is year after year, maybe not year after year, but, you know, if you look at it over the last you know, 13 years we've competed, even just the rules like espresso, what it used to be deemed as like the look of it, the crema was really important. Six now, points. Yeah, it was out of six points. Yeah. And you had to like tilt your cup to see if it stuck together. Nowadays. Tiger, tiger striving. Yeah. Flecking. <laughs> How's your flecking? We were just talking about in the last episode. So okay. Like this, uh, if the, in the cappuccino, the spoon would sit in place, yeah. you put it there. And yeah. Yeah. So if... Uh, it's changed a lot. I remember really well when I was uh, watching William Davis' uh, performance. Yeah, it's totally different. Yeah. I mean, the man was so relaxed. Uh, and now, if you think about it, everything is packed all together like to, to perfection. Yeah? yeah, to fit those 15 minutes where you have to impress either with coffee, customer service. Everything has to be like impeccable. Yeah. So, yeah. Wh wh what do you, do you guys? Um, do in your um, trainings with uh, national baristas as Christy is right now, yeah, besides taking my autocomb. <laughs> <laughs> Without should we talk about that for yeah, a minute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. want to talk about it? Vent to us. Yeah, we're, we're here to really talk to you about suffering, it if you'd like to. <laughs> it's like I'm working with a single boiler espresso machine, <laughs> uh, you know. It's such a big difference. I don't know yeah. if you agree on this, but... You're just... You're just I'm a princess attached. now. I'm really attached. <laughs> yeah. So what, what do you usually have? Like, where do you start? How do you uh, evaluate? How do you, how do you choose the competition? Exactly. Because sometimes maybe it's not the barista competition for you. Maybe it's, I don't know, some other. How, how do you relate yourself with a, a certain competition? I, I guess... So there's sort of two questions there. I, I think we'll take this one first, then we'll go into how we're right. working with, with Christy, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've competed, Dave and I have competed uh, working with people or competed ourselves in barista, brewers, coffee and good spirits, latte art, and cup tasters. Those are the, the different disciplines we have in Canada. We don't have 
Ebrick until this year. This is our first year of Ebrick. We have a competitor going to Ebrick. Let's go, Scott. Canada, <laughs> nice. Ebrick, we're coming for you, okay? <laughs> we're training hard already. We do not have a roasting championship in Canada, so we've never participated. Don't All really right. know the, the structure as well as we maybe should. But uh, do you have places where to buy Ebrick in Canada? Yeah, in Europe. Europe. Yeah, in, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, Europe we're right loading now, up man. before we'll we go them, home. We'll get them here. <laughs> <laughs> we have a huge advantage over the other competitors <laughs> just by being here. Um, I, I think the different disciplines sort of feed into different people. Like I think a more analytical, rigid, maybe engineering type of person is maybe better suited for a Brewers Cup. Mm -hmm. Just there's so many fine details or behind roasting. the scenes roasting, and, yeah. and roasting where barista a little bit more uh, of an actor playful superstars. you know superstar maybe Terry's i don't like that word because i was in the barista and i'm not sure i want to relate to that but uh, <laughs> a little bit more Pre jovial Madonna. a little bit more hey now um creative outside of the box you know contemporary let's say i like contemporary <laughs> more that sounds nicer um but i think it, it's not a one size fit all fits all. You can fit different people into the different disciplines and, and definitely have great results. I competed in barista last year. It's not the competition for me or Brewers. pardon me, brewers last year. That's not the competition for me. I found it to be too constrained and, and uh, there's not enough innovation, not enough creativity, not enough, uh, that yeah, you, you, you the as the brewer, to yourself, you know, into, yeah, yeah. Something like that. It's, it's a coffee competition, not yes. a brewer's competition, in my opinion, where barista is not a coffee competition. It's about the person that's on stage. It's maybe the way to, to yeah, yeah. map that out. That's interesting. interesting. Good so if you have a story to tell, probably barista, right? You can create more of an arc in barista uh -huh. than you could in brewers. And the, ti the timeline, like 10 minutes, very quick to tell that story versus brewers or barista you can you can tell so if if your coffee has a story it's better to go to brewers cup maybe or if you have a story as barista then maybe barista is a better competition for you yep right some sort of yeah right. no I I every remember, time i right. remember asking uh, sorry for interruption uh, at bugan in milano in yeah when we were there two years ago i was asking uh, if you remember the name i'm not really sure about it because i've only met the guy once and Daniele. Uh, sorry Daniele Daniele and I was asking the guy so how do you choose your future champions yeah uh, he didn't speak too much English I don't speak Italian so it was like you know this and I was like yeah <laughs> so know this it has to be killer mm. that was his uh, vi vision yeah wow. and he produced loads of champions ah you're talking about Maurizio or Maurizio, yeah, yeah, yeah. the crazy one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maurizio yeah, is crazy. <laughs> so I like that, you know? Um, it was like... I think you can also train through this, though. You can get through it. Right? This is, this is just... It's nerves of not being prepared. It could be more than that, but if the more you prepare, the, the more you'll get rid of this. You could eat bananas. They're filled with potassium. They'll get over your nerves a mm -hmm. little bit. They'll edge you off. You could do... I think lots of things to try to eliminate the the shakes and mm -hmm. the the nervousness that like we, we've trained with lots of people and some people have nerves and other people don't and it's it's also how do you get the most out of your competitor like as a coach that's what one of my roles is is like how does this person work how can we get them when they're on stage to be at 110 percent and for some competitors that's lots of practice and repetition mm -hmm. other competitors it's more about not freestyling, but they have more creativity in the sentences they're saying. So my brother would be a good example of, you know, hey, man, say the line like this. And then he says it differently every single time. And it drives me crazy. <laughs> but the same point gets across. And then he'll say one that's like the best one. And then we forget what he actually said. <laughs> but there are, there are these Asian guys, for example, who are effectively learning English just for that competition, just for the competition. So yeah. Yeah. you feel them that they are robotics ro robots they mm -hmm. are doing uh, their routine like a robot and uh, at the end of routine when you ask them in something in English they don't even they cannot mm -hmm. even respond to that so yeah. it's clearly that they have a um, huge uh, willing to learn like every detail of it 
I think Europeans or North Americans are more into maybe sometimes improvising or dealing with uh, new uh, lines. We, we also just, you know, we have such an advantage. We're, you know, we speak English every day. I was just we, thinking about it. And we it. don't, you know, writing a script is not as a big of a deal for us because we're, we're not having to memorize a yeah, new yeah, language. Yeah. If it was in Italian, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if... I know I sure couldn't do it. Maybe you could, but... Buonasera! Ma che dici? No, no, no. Okay, okay. You guys are good to go. <laughs> but that, thinking on how impressive it is to memorize a speech yeah. in a different language and actions while yeah. also moving, performing... Looking natural. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And making it not look rehearsed. Yeah. But statistically, do you think introverts versus extroverts have some uh, difficulties, or you can be both? You can be introvert and still win the competition. I think you can be yeah. introverted and still yeah. win the competition. Yeah. yeah, I think I think as long as you can kind of switch it, switch it on and off. I actually think being an extrovert in the competition, it's it's really draining because all of a sudden you're in a room with a bunch of people that have like-minded you know, thoughts, you're, you're with, let's say, the best of the industry, if, if uh, that's an appropriate way to say what the world of coffee is, all the, the minds of the industry gather in a room, you're an extrovert, you want to talk to all of them, <laughs> but you're in the competition, you want to spare your energy, you, so you have to restrain from going and catching up with, hey, Bogdan, what's going on, how's everything in Marone, you know, what's uh, new, what's happening in your world, and, and you've got to figure out a way to navigate between those things, where if you're introverted, you don't care. You don't. You just you have don't your really problem. care. You just follow mm -hmm. your. Uh, you're just yeah. there to to do what you're there to do, Absolutely. and and uh, you just need the discipline to say, okay, my stuff is ready to go. I'm ready to go. My cart is built. Roll me out on stage. I'm not talking to anybody today. Rock and roll. Let's do this thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll go back to the hotel when I'm done. <laughs> so how do you start building a? Um, uh, competition routine how do you start prepare for a competition if you somebody who uh, looks to this podcast is thinking about going to the nationals this year how what he would supposed to do uh, in terms of I don't know finding a concept or what do you recommend to plan I think you go first I got I got some thoughts I think there's lots of different ways you can go about it I think one you can kind of get uh, maybe inspired by a coffee, you taste something and you go, oh shit, you know, the, I, the product itself, the, the product yeah. itself, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then you could build a routine based on the backbone of mm -hmm. uh, the coffee and the experience you had on the cupping table in the cafe, you know, here, there, everywhere, whatever your narrative might be. So I think that's one way you can go about building a, a theme presentation, or you could go about it with, you know, grabbing maybe a singular word or a, a sentence and sort of taking yourself back to high school where you're writing a, an essay. And, you know, you open with, with your sentence, you close with the same sentence, you serve your three courses that kind of just keep reflecting on the same sentence, mm -hmm. and now you've built your essay, you got that sort of routine. So... Uh, as an example, one year I competed and the theme was trust and just every every so course related motive to of your routine. Yeah. So yeah, you build around it. How I sourced the coffee is about the trust with these guys, how the coffee was roasted was about the trust of my roaster, how I don't know, some other corny line that fed mm -hmm. into the third thing and now I got a presentation on So on trust. from your opinion you can mostly get into competition from two sides yeah either the coffee or the program or the concept behind it yeah or maybe or you have might, an innovation and you want to present the innovation. Oh, innovation that's never been my angle it's also like a concept so i think it falls under the same category here yeah. so yeah, yeah. I, th I think my first suggestion would be sign up so many people <laughs> say they want to do competition and they're waiting for this like transcendental moment that's going to happen in the cafe or on the cupping table and it's like no just sign up mm. and try it mm -hmm. and find out if you like it i would call this um, something like the lottery syndrome you know first you have to play yeah and you then get, you'll find out if you're going to win and when you yeah. sign up then it's going to hit you like oh i got to build 
a presentation, I gotta find a coffee, and then it starts getting you in gear. Uh -huh. Oh, I got four weeks, I got three weeks, I got six months, whatever it is. We just, we have a lot of people are so focused beforehand on like, oh, do I need a theme? Do I need a coffee? It's like, yeah, you do. You need to sign up. And it sounds kind of stupid and simple, but it's like, it's such an important part. And people are really nervous about like failing and not doing well. And it's like, it took us eight years to win Canada. Mm -hmm. It takes most competitors a long time to win. Yeah, and it's a learning so curve. We've competed for eight years. Uh, we we won the on the eighth year, the ninth year. We went back on the tenth year, did not win. Uh -huh. And then I have not competed in barista since. We've worked with other people mm -hmm. every other year since then. The last year you competed with, um, with a decaf. In right? 2020, decaf espresso, yeah. Yeah. We removed the caffeine from a La Palma El Tucan Bio Innovation Geisha, and it was, mm -hmm. it was a cool coffee, very oh. delicious. There were other coffees used in the presentation too. It was not a nationals presentation. We'd also say there's a distinction between nationals and, and worlds in terms of presentation complexity, delivery, etc. cetera. Um, so I should have saved that for worlds if, if I should have ever done that at all. Maybe I shouldn't have ever done it at all, but should have been saved for worlds and mm -hmm. should have done more simple in the national. All right. But I, I agree with Dave, step number one, sign up. The worst thing you can do is learn something, yeah. right? And, and see and it as like self-improvement. Like, I'm gonna get better at public speaking. I'm gonna get better at understanding coffee. I'm gonna get better at dialing coffee. And then, meet some people in the community. Yeah, and it's exactly. like, it's one of the yeah. best, for an average barista, it's the best way to grow your coffee career very quickly. So you would recommend for every barista who wants to like perform or do it for, for real, yeah? You would recommend yeah. going to at least one competition to... When Cole won, the day before he won, and the day after he won, he was the same guy. But all of a sudden, he, had, he was an authority. Absolutely. After winning. Yeah. But nothing, nothing's really changed. He had the same theories before he won. Mm -hmm. But now that he's won, people go... I knew nothing go. before I won. I knew nothing <laughs> after I won. But <laughs> people started to believe that. It's uh, good that you but, know but that it also, what you don't know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it also in politics. Yeah. <laughs> But it also gave him the confidence to say, like, hey, I do know my stuff. Absolutely. I can become a, an authority and say certain things, and people will agree or yeah. so disagree. Let's, let's follow a bit this uh, thread. So what did change for, for you, for instance? Yeah, Did people start coming to, to you for advices or, I know, for... I'm gonna start a coffee shop, so what would you recommend? I know, with this authority comes the, some... The problem with these champions is after they, they win, you want to go have a coffee from them, but they are never there. Yeah, they don't <laughs> yeah. work in the shops, yeah. right? Yeah. Because now yeah. they are some, I'm not I'm superstars, but some stars. Uh -huh. And you can't find them. So when is he working? I want a shot from him. And uh -huh. I see what you, what you did here. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is awkward. <laughs> yeah, a bit, yeah. So, so are you still working? So I haven't made an espresso <laughs> so guys. since that day. <laughs> But you still, uh, I don't know, capitalize on it, yeah? On, uh, no, I, I yeah. think the biggest thing that changed is just that it's what Dave is saying. It's a level of respect. I think uh, people didn't really care. I think not, not just me, that us, our company, our, our business back home, and then all of a sudden things changed where people, let's say producers, wanted to work with us. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that they didn't want to beforehand, but all of a sudden... They knew about you know us. all of a sudden they know about us uh -huh. and they they want to work with us so maybe that changed i think some industry peers maybe were were speaking more on an eye to eye level than looking down to us uh i think i think for uh, let's say my parents they all of a sudden understood that okay what we're doing is actually like a real you know, job you're doing a real job you're doing a really There's good thing like you're going this, to a yes. world mm -hmm. championship to do this thing like you can live yeah recently you're, you're doing you're doing okay like we are actually proud of you and nice. i don't know if if there's anything beyond that but i think it's just a, a level of respect changed mm -hmm. and i, I, I think, think it also builds confidence within the team the company yeah. individuals that you feel like oh the way we are roasting people do like it and yes obviously tons of customers come in every day and drink the coffee but it's like oh our peers enjoy our coffee not just our customers or, uh, oh, we've learned how to extract espresso 
to some level that people enjoy at you know this competition so i still want to underline that champions should take at least one shift per week per week in, in a, in a to shop, enjoy yeah. their presence yeah there uh, i remember the first uh, one of the times i met uh, colin uh, he was having some partnership with uh, della corte yeah and uh, i managed to be part of his dialing uh, procedure uh, during the one of, one of those days, the opening day. And uh, when you are next to a champion, you get some coffee shots from him. Uh, you share thoughts with him for a junior, for uh, somebody that's just a coffee lover. The unique uh, feeling that you have is, is pretty nice. So for me, for example, it was a moment that I remember that somebody who had a lot of experience and a lot of um, skills, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can share some coffees with him. So that, that's a very nice moment. And I think uh, those guys who won a lot of competition should remember this and from yeah. time to time to get back to uh, the behind the bar, yeah. have some shots with the people who uh, would really want to taste their coffees. Yeah. Um, barista competition is the most important one because if if we are really honest, the names you remember in this industry during the years it's are mostly, mostly yeah. from barista competition. I mean, from Sasha to some other guys. It's creating uh, some kind of icon. Yeah. Uh, and you always look up for these champions as well. Yeah. But this comes so, with uh, some pressure, maybe. Because once you're there, um, you have a responsibility, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Something I was going to say is, you know, it's important to remember that just because somebody won one of these championships, they're still normal people. Like, Are they? Like I, I think <laughs> I think I'm still a pretty normal guy. I like to think that I'm not on a pedestal that's beyond other people. I don't think I know more than the next person in the industry. Like being at the roastery this week, your your team is very knowledgeable, and some of the, some of the theories and and protocols and uh, systems that they know about roasting that they're telling me, I'm I'm kind of, you know, I'm like yeah, totally, <laughs> totally, I'm with you. I don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> and and I I mean yeah. that in the best way because I'm here to learn just You're as much as the next the person. Learning I think. process, yeah, yeah it it's, never it's stops. not that. You know, we're we're champions now. We know everything. Like I think we're we're still eager and keen to learn. We're still eager and keen to connect with people. We're people just like everyone else. The difference is we did this dance routine where we made coffee during it, and we did a nice presentation, and we scored well in it. Mm -hmm. I think I think part of it though is giving back. Mm -hmm. You know, inspiring. We, yeah, inspiring the next Others, generation. Yeah. Like, you know, we helped Boram win WBC last year, and part of you know, the months leading after it, it was like, okay, with, he wanted to tour around and it, you know, his presentation is about the dream team. So he couldn't tour by himself. So we got to carry his bags and do some of the presentations. And part of that was giving back to the community. And, and it's really important that every champion, national champion or anyone who competes, it's like passing the knowledge on to others is, is really important instead of hoarding it to yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were, you know, doing seminars, we did bar takeovers, working with other baristas, and uh, yeah, trying to inspire like the next generation of like competitors and also coffee professionals. And we want to see like, I think one of our dreams would be like, you know, if you win or finish in the top six in WBC, it can like change your life, like financially for your career. But how about if like every competitor who competed at WBC, they had that same opportunity? or like national champions and the top six in each country, it was uh, a turning point in their career to, you know, financially feasible or other opportunities. And I think as we professionalize the competition and get more sponsors in, uh, we can, we can kind of like see that as an opportunity. It's an opportunity now, but more so like in the, in the future, for sure. Mm -hmm. More in the realm of athletics, right? Yeah. Where You've got, we were just watching tennis before we, we came here, and you've got the, the 94th best tennis player on she's the court. She's got 900K she's, she's made this year. Yeah. And it's like, wow. 
it's a big difference given the fact that the effort is pretty much massive as well if you want to prepare for real uh, for this kind of yeah. things yeah, yeah. So the effort uh, it's huge so is there a point where coffee competitions can shift to a realm of being parallel to professional sports I wish yeah. where I there's would, multi-year I, I contracts going out or like Netflix we need like a show like yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. to yeah. like th have that turning point of like we had this conversation early in one, is, yeah. one of the episodes and we we said at that time that it would be amazing to have competitions where the judges are paid to do yeah. that yeah coaches are paid to coach uh, and maybe to have for some competitions like uh, some sort of um, annual schedule like rounds, for example, for cup tasting, to have, I don't know, Australian Open, British yeah, Open, absolutely. Romanian yeah. Open. So you get points, but maybe at the end of the year, you can say, okay, this is the best copper in the world because he got points from each of these mm -hmm. events. Mm -hmm. or some Do you feel like this uh, industry might go there in like the next some years, 10 years or so? I, I think is, we can. Is this feasible? Is imagine, this imagine it was to date myself here but imagine it was like i don't know 1980 or something and you said chefs are going to be some of the most important people you know chefs used to be in like the back room and they're yeah, dungeon yeah they would and you would like hide them and yeah. now they're like rock stars in the middle like a kitchen's built in the middle of a restaurant everyone wants to sit around the kitchen yeah. and it's like this shifts happen they, mm -hmm. you know we spend millions of dollars on cookbooks there's uh, tons of tv shows about cooking yeah. If you think about like, and who watches these? I don't want no one like, <laughs> but it's a big, it's a massive industry, and coffee should be Chef's a, table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if if you think about like let, let's name it now, yeah. If you think about Jamie Oliver, he has a huge reach. Yeah. Everybody knows, mostly on the planet. Yeah, who's we who's have James Hoffman. But we have James Hoffman, which is yeah. good as well. But yeah. I, I don't think he has the same kind of like image and power. Worldwide. So may maybe the difference is what you said, the, the baristas aren't working in coffee, right? They're no longer behind the bar. Yeah. But, but Jamie, Jamie Oliver's has not restaurants. The, he's, not, he's not at the no, restaurant. I just, is he I just not at the restaurant the, a day a week? Or, no, he's or got like a hundred restaurants, man. He has, but yeah. he still doesn't work. As, uh, maybe he's not I, the right example. I think it's a matter of time. Because uh, tennis, for example, in the first 20, 30 exactly. years of uh, playing tennis, it was just a hobby for most of those guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were playing with long uh, um, um, clothes Skirts, and yeah. it was a little bit uncomfortable, but it was a hobby. And then starting little by little, it became professional, semi-professional, then professional. I think maybe barista competitions will be the same. It's, it's going to take time, but I think the amount of time that's being spent, like the competitors and the whatever, top 30, are spending real money and time and energy, yeah. and we're, it's, it's only going to get harder. Yeah. We need, I think we need two, two things to happen this. I think we need uh, some companies to invest real money in mm -hmm. not only giving a kettle or a book press or something. Two to liters of milk or something like that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, even in nationals, because <laughs> this is a huge problem. Uh, and then second, we need uh, Netflix, as you said, yeah. uh, like tennis has the breaking point. Uh, Formula One has b drive to survive. Um, kitchen uh, food industry have chef go. We need somebody who will promote this. Uh, and we've, we've had a few like barista, the movie we've, we've had a few, but it's like, we need one to hit Netflix or exactly. Amazon prime or whatever. And it, they feature it that, you know, we dr everyone drinks, not everyone, almost everyone drinks coffee. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. such a international beverage that Absolutely. it could be it the next rabbit power, hole yeah, people can get thing. into. And, we saw it during, you know, COVID. Lots of people just got into home brewing, and that sparked, you know, the home brewing revolution or whatever. But we sh we need hopefully another one to come for like coffee competitions, and that'll spark a different group of people to be really interested. And do, do you think like something might be blocking these ideas right now, or we just don't have the person or the vision, or I don't know we're just not ready to? I think do if this? You, if you're not in the industry. Is there any way you know about the coffee competitions? It's really a really good question because um, it's not on, it's they, not they on ESPN. It's mm -hmm. not on mm -hmm. any sort of televised thing. It's live stream. Maybe even the live stream is pretty f here and there from, yeah. yeah. In some parts of Asia, maybe the level. It's There's a, a different degree of respect yeah. over there for the competition. So it's a media issue at this point. Might possibly. Be. Possibly, yeah. Possibly. But maybe there is a click that 
one mm -hmm. day will happen and uh, will drive some interest to this. Uh, also, maybe there are some projects like top 50 best that needs to be yeah. adjusted to yeah. specialty yeah. Caf coffee. Cafe cafes would help. Yeah. yeah. I guess the biggest thing would be media. If we get a media deal, it's the same thing you guys are saying about Netflix. You know, if somebody came in and said, hey, here's the package we're willing to give. It's worth X amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. This is how most, most sports leagues work. They get a, yeah. a media deal and uh, I follow NBA. I know in NBA that media rights are 49%. Players get 51%. That's how revenues split. And if you could do the same thing and generate revenue mm -hmm. that way based on viewership for, for coffee competitions, could we? But they've also you know? got, when did the NBA start? 75, 80 years ago? Yeah. So we got, we got some time we got to some catch time up. For sure. But, but how for about sure. if SCA would give to the winner of Barista Championship, World well, Barista Champion, 50,000 bucks? From all those booths that are, they are renting during the Wolf Coffee, for example. So that might attract a lot of interest from, uh, I don't know, competitors or... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Definitely right. changes the stakes. Yeah, yeah. When somebody asks right now, what are you competing for? You're kind of like... Hmm. Prestige. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And you spend so, a lot more money that uh, you're going to get from yeah. winning, yeah? Yeah. Or, right. I'm, I'm not familiar with this. Uh, this year, though, there was... Borem did win money. He really? Won, he won 5,000 euros. Oh, yeah. oh wow. That much. So one, one sponsor came in with, right. with yeah. cash. But it's that something... It's very unusual. I don't think oh, it's right. happened before. Oh, okay. I'm curious if it will happen next time as well. That's, that's what we need to see. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, do you think a coffee competition like Barista could be a projection for the future of this industry? Do you see things... Because we see small things that now we use because we saw first time into a coffee competition, but do you think this should be a projection of the future, a, a barista routine? You go first. Uh, I think for a segment of the industry, it's important. They see it as it's either driving innovation or... Um, yeah, it's the future of what's going on, but I think there's another segment that really is turned off by competition. They think, you know, and part of them is not wrong, like expensive coffee, coffees win, or it's really expensive to compete, and like, what's the point? And so you kind of see those comments in social media, so mm -hmm. I think innovation's important through competition, because you kind of create rules like F1, and it's, uh, it just takes time. So and do you think it's a bubble? Part of it is part of wolf? it is a, a bubble, um, but that bubble breaks through because you see things going into cafes. That Eventually, are yeah, yeah, you're gonna see them in practice. Yeah, Even not every moment, not every cafe is gonna do like absolutely distributors, but a lot do. Eighty yeah. percent probably do some sort of distribution tool. OCD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now uh, the new one. Autocom. Autocom. Yeah. yeah. I'm still Yours works crying. great, by the way, at the roastery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased to, to know that uh, it's in your hands. Uh, hopefully, you've changed some of the needles. <laughs> we, we did. did. Yeah. We did. Yeah. 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 But uh, anyhow, the second one is coming. Yeah. 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 Chris, Chris, Chris moved, confirmed yeah. me today. So big yeah. respect for this one. <laughs> we are uh, so rich in this country <laughs> that we barely affair <laughs> for the second <laughs> one. Yeah, you have to make like loads of paper just to get it in the country. I was sitting for about six hours or seven hours just to make the papers for and the guy at the, the asked me the so, custom yeah, customs. And he asked me, So what is this tool? I mean, uh, you know, I'm a barista, I'm making coffee, so yeah. this one, it's like a distribution tool. It just breaks some of the stuff there. So wow. it's like, all right, uh, so uh, you do what? <laughs> and also the kills the president. Right? Acupuncture, acupuncture for coffee. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, are, uh, you, you want to answer to Bogdan's question? Yeah, I, I think my hope is yes, because I think barista competition gives such a good structure for making coffee. Mm. And, you know, zoom out of what people are saying on stage and zoom out of the expensive coffees and zoom out of all of that stuff. If you look at the technical score sheet, that is, that is a rubric step by step for making a quality, consistent coffee beverage in a clean and functional manner, start to finish. Mm -hmm. If you can execute that at a top level, you can make a really great coffee. And that is 100% functional in a cafe. 
-hmm. right? It, it literally goes one step after another. Did you spill and waste grinds? You don't want to do that on a day-to-day -day basis because that ends up being money. And that, that's not just money. That's somebody's time and energy all the way down the line. So you, you got that. You got tools. Can we do them fast? Can we do our distribution the same every single time? Did you flush the group head? Did you wipe the tray? Did you waste a bunch of milk? Like, it's, it's a platform Good for practices. making the yeah. best quality coffee in the world. So put, put the egos aside. Put the expensive whatever you think is there aside. If, if you're not following, you're falling behind, in my opinion. And you don't need an expensive coffee to win. It's a barista competition. It's, it's the skill set of a barista that can deliver the top quality experience using whatever they have in their ammunition in terms of coffee. It does not need to be the most expensive, the most complex, the highest SCA as scoring, as, uh, the most uh, anything. You, you don't do it like well and you don't do it uh, clean, but, and yeah, as you said. Yeah, you just have to deliver an exceptional experience. Mm -hmm. It's literally it's what's, about what's experience written in the rules. It's, and the experience is coming from the barista of like, it's going to taste like X, Y, and Z. And is the judges perceiving that? Mm -hmm. We have but a saying back home is like, what you say and what you do, are they the same, are they the same thing? That. That's yeah, awesome. They, they match. That. Yeah. And are they, how aligned are they? Uh -huh. And a lot of people, you know, they don't quite align. They're, you know, mm -hmm. it said it, it was going to taste like this and it tastes like this. Or the experiences I'm going to talk about, I don't know. But you mentioned uh, the term great coffee. I think we still have a difference between what great coffee means for a judge and what great coffee means for a customer. Yeah. Should this industry bring more close these two things or do you think uh, it should remain like a uh, the, 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 the the coffee that a judge is tasting is the next level of some coffee that we use in coffee shops? I, I think if we reflect on our history in the competition coffee we served in 2010, the first year we competed, was a washed Catuayi from Panama that you probably wouldn't even put on your menu today. Mm -hmm. Like, it was, it was a great coffee then, it's an okay coffee now. And if you keep going year after year and, and seeing what's being used in the competition and what's being used in coffee shops, they're both doing this. It's like a gap of how right. many years? Five mm -hmm. years or something, yeah. Yeah, and they're both they're both trending up, mm -hmm. up and to the right. In parallel. Eventually, yeah. yeah. Eventually, it's going to happen. Uh, same with Eugenides. It's going to become just more and more accessible. Bought, yeah. We're going to see it, it more and more often. Unthinkable to drink. Uh, three two years, years ago. Two yeah, years yeah, ago, yeah. 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 But uh, now it's Tim starting. Wendelbo won with a Robusta blend. The <laughs> um, you monster. <laughs> you monster, yeah. And he won with a Robusta blend. James Hoffman was mm -hmm. the first guy to say. The origin. The Not origin the, of the coffee he's using. Now that you was, know the that podcast was 15 that I was, years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yesterday I uh, heard the podcast that uh, you were invited in. Uh, it was uh, registered two, two years ago. And you said it that in 13 years ago, James Hoffman said for the first time variety. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So it was for me, it was like shocking. Yeah, really, dude. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, it's nice it's, to see. It's ramped up, like mm -hmm. the technology information, it's ramped way up. And I think it'll, you know, Do we're raising the level up more and more. So it seems like, oh, we're going to this crazy, you know, $3,000 a pound coffee. But it's yeah. like, no, the average coffee is getting so much better. We're mm -hmm. roasting it so much better. We're yeah, brewing yeah. it so much better. When we started, you know, you used to tap the side of the portafilter before you tamped it. That was like the process the of making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how bizarre. You know, and it was like, oh, get the grinds off the side of the portafilter into the middle and then tamp it. Tamp it with 60 pounds. Why? I don't know. Someone said it at some point. So just do it. Would you risk guessing what's the future of this competition next 10 years? 10 years? Hard Tough to is, say, right? It's hard to say. I think, I think the whole thing will get scrapped and rebuilt. The whole thing? Not, not the whole thing, but... It, you know, we just saw That's a, a huge, take. huge... Cut that? That's a bad take. <laughs> we just saw it. a huge change. Like, uh, we all of a sudden have alternative milks. That's a dramatic, dramatic shift in the industry for, for coffee competitions. I didn't see that coming maybe five years mm -hmm. ago. There was a lot of pressure to make it happen, but it seemed there was a lot of resistance to hold it back, too. And, you know, now it's a normal thing. We're going to see a huge innovation in that category. I think Oatly would be a good sponsor for those fifty thousand dollars for the winner. Just to start with, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, they have I mean, plenty of money, dude. 
Yeah, but yeah, I'm with you on this one because usually when something gets big uh, really fast, yeah, usually th there comes a period where everybody starts to just take all the non-essentials yeah. aside and see, all right, so why are we here? What are we doing here? Yeah, yeah. so might scale down a bit. Like or maybe we see a compulsory. I think that, yeah, that that's that would something be that's coming, and yeah. I think that's a that's bit of a blow step. up and rebuild because you got to completely restructure the platform in order to do a compulsory round. And the unthinkable happened this year with uh, the automatic machine being used in uh, coffee competitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a little misleading what they've said. It's still manual, it's still a manual steam, but it's an automatic machine. They don't dial in the espresso anyway in the latte <laughs> or championship. They're pulling let's, 14 seconds to get the big you know, thick let's, crema. Let's get it real. They're still <laughs> they're still doing a manual steam. It got a little blown out of proportion. Yeah, but you 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 know you don't know what might happen to uh, on the other competitions because if they stick with latte art, okay, no problem. But if they go to to the next one, I mean, how about having a tone for Brewers Cup? or yeah. Marco or I don't know yeah might happen I don't what know. happens when we automate our auto comb that's next to the puck press that's next to the group head that's yeah, what happens then? next to my what, grind what by way grinder I, we're I in think, an automated we're, industry we're, already yeah we're moving into that direction more and more and I think it's artificial where, intelligence where where is the fine line of like the barista is still feeling like they're in control but it's actually like not robots, but it's like automations taking, they think the craft away from them. There was a point in time when, you know, we started, I started in Rosso back in 2007. We didn't weigh coffee then. In 2007, you no one monster. weighed coffee. How could you make it? I know, we didn't. You just looked at the dose and then you put it back into the dosing chamber. Yeah. And then I you know. tap. And then we instilled. I used to do this as well, yes, and, and I was like, like the trainings were for, you just have to see how it pours. And yeah. at some point. 25 seconds. Somewhere there, because you don't, don't stop it at 25 each and every time, but it was s s something like a blonde coming out yeah. of the yeah. yeah, so that's where you just have to stop it. And we told the baristas, okay, we're going to put in scales. You're going to weigh every single shot. And what? people ref yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, people refused. They were like, absolutely not. We don't have time. Yeah. What do you mean you don't have time? It takes like three extra seconds. No, but dude, you're taking away my creativity. Yeah, because I know how big the dose is, but you've never weighed the dose. You never have to do like that. And after we, that, we had people <laughs> quit. Yeah. We're really? Put in scales. Yeah. Now scales are built into grinders. You watch a barista try to make coffee without scales, and they've been using them. They're like, they're, it's yeah. something artistic and uh, novelty implied in but it. But it all so of a sudden like, creeps in, right? Yeah. And then absolutely. it's like, okay, well, I used to, you know, do my movements to distribute the coffee. Well, now we have distributors. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's creeped in a bit more. Okay, well, I don't have an extra scale. It's just built into my grinder, so I don't do that action anymore. Well, we have puck presses now. I don't tamp anymore. What about the scale built into your, your oh, my God. group head? No. Yes. <laughs> right? It's, com it's coming. It's all going to get integrated in and soon, and there's machines that already do it. It does all that for you. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's better than some baristas. It's better than most baristas. Yeah, I agree, but it's not uh, better than the best baristas. No, so true. that's where uh, you have to book press. No, so this is where I've we need to look. baristas tamping better than book press. Okay. For, for sure, there's some people that use the book press wrong <laughs> or don't clean it. There's so let me let me give you something like uh, uh, the same image but in roasting. How would this uh, look like? Yeah. Well, there's automation. automation. If you just people automate were cheering, the roast. <laughs> people yeah. were cheering that Stronghold just got the. Yeah, right. A inside. They're, yeah. they're now the roasting machine. Well, they have an auto replicate that takes me out of the roasting. I'm no longer in charge. But so the production uh, guy is free to go away. Well, everything's you will tell to, through GPT, ChatGPT, yeah. whatever you need, and ChatGPT right, will so, be connected so who, to the who's gonna decide soft, like the profile because the machine can't taste. Yeah. Oh, well, we can get an sure. AI software that oh, can, right. can use the aromatic <laughs> compounds of green or roasted coffee so to dictate where, where we need to profile. Go, as far as I, yeah, that's going to be the future of it. So we're just going to stay Think here about how much more we will know as individuals or as a community about coffee by having that sort of software. Hmm. I think I think a great a great thing to zoom in on, and I'll throw myself under the bus. I presented that Cedra is a red bourbon and Tipica on the world stage because that was what I read off the internet in my research. Recently, World Coffee Research has proven that 
Sidra is not even related to those things. Oh man, it's, it's gonna an be e- gonna take It's a- an Ethiopian yeah. land race. And here I am thinking, geez, I shouldn't have I plagiarized do? that article. I should have figured out my own data point. But I don't have anything else to fall back on. I just, you know, I'm a barista. I'm reading what's online to, to learn. Think about how much faster we can learn with this sort of stuff and how much quicker we can advance the industry to, to really understand coffee. Mm-hmm. So we are such a young industry right now, we don't understand what we're doing. We pretend we do. We have theories that we think are doing mm-hmm. what we think they're doing. The yeah. coolest but thing they're on earth. proven wrong all the time. After right? some and years, yeah, some of them. Mm. And, and the, so, the and ones that factual. haven't. Some are factual, yeah, and, they, yeah. and we're like, oh, th- thank goodness, we've been doing it right. Mm-hmm. Um, we, d- I think we need to bring in technology while at the same time harnessing the creativity that yeah. brews And the passion roasters. as well, yeah. Yes, and what, what rules all of it is flavor. Flavor drives everything. So even if the AI or the espresso machine that's automatic makes a cup of coffee, we human beings have to taste it, and if it's no good, then we have to tell the machine or whatever software, like, hey, this is, we got to improve it this way. Because give me more red fruits. <laughs> I, I, I like this. Flavor drives everything. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. And yeah. it's, we, we have to be involved in that. Uh-huh. We have to I decide because we're going to consume this. Yeah, so yeah. we have to but be the you, judges of what's going to happen. You are two guys that travel a lot and met a lot of uh, cultures, uh, specialty coffee cultures as well. Um, how do you relate with different w- ways that uh, these guys are having the perception of coffee between Asians, Europeans, I don't know, Colombians or South, South America, Latin America, mm-hmm. and maybe in Canada? Because if you're going to some competition where most of the judges are, uh, let's say, from Asian countries, uh, you will prepare in that direction. If you're going to a competition in Europe and you'll have a lot of Greek guys competing, uh, judging, you will think maybe they have some sort of different perception. So um, now you are um, working with a Filipino barista for World Championships, a European one, Romanian, and uh, in a few weeks you will work with a Canadian um, barista. Three different cultures. How do you uh, adapt to the um, to the perception of coffee from two different country, uh, continents. Why well, you talk about coffee and I'll talk about judging? Yeah, sure. We so of the three, the Canadian is still going through the national championships, so there's a bit of a different perspective there. Uh, otherwise, I think we have to take a global approach going to worlds. We have to be mindful of flavors that we're going to call in in a coffee that we're going to choose, I think a good flavor to zoom in on is mango. Mango is is a terrible flavor, in my opinion, for an espresso at a world championship, because there's over 200 different varieties of mangoes around the world. In Romania, I assume you don't grow them. In Canada, we don't grow them, so we import them. So we're going to be importing different types of mangoes. In Canada, they're often quite acidic because they don't, well. they don't get the opportunity to fully ripen because of the way they're shipped and whatever. That doesn't matter. You go to Guatemala, oh man, are the mangoes ever good and sweet and juicy and a tactile sensation. And there's, there's such a different spectrum of flavor opportunity within the category of mango. But you look at mandarin orange. Mandarin orange is a mandarin orange everywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is sweet. It's got some acidity, it's got a little bit of like a floral sensation, nice aromatics, it's juicy. That's the same sort of flavor profile everywhere. Strawberry, you can kind of put in a similar camp. There's, there's certain flavors that ideally you shouldn't take to, to the world stage. It's a really regional, localized Saskatoon berry for all of our Canadians out there. And nobody else, because Saskatoon berries are local to Canada. Mm-hmm. You could call that in the Canadian championships. But even then, it's, it's a slight risk that you've got a judge that's not familiar. Like, go, go more globalized in the perspective, which is also a tough thing to do if, if you are not familiar with the global sort of taste lexicon. Mm-hmm. We have the fortune or, or uh, opportunity to travel and, and get to taste different things in different cultures. Uh, where we live, there's not a lot of like sour, acidic foods. So the general taste preference in, in coffee in Canada 
is not acidic. Acid is the enemy in a lot of ways in Canadian coffee. People want something that's sweet or bittersweet because that's the familiar it's flavor familiar. profile. It's, yeah, you know it. Yeah. That's interesting. So it's Where a matter of historical culture of that country. A, a little bit. Yeah. Like Dave and I were doing a show a couple of months ago. We're in Korea and I've got a double anaerobic java that I'm brewing. And I've told this story. Dave's heard this story 40 times. He was also there. So sorry to repeat 42. this story. No, yeah, yeah 40, you can check your phone if you want. And, <laughs> and so I'll I'm check brewing. if it's the same version. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I change it slightly yeah, every yeah. time to keep him, uh, keep him paying <laughs> attention. <laughs> so, so I'm brewing this coffee and my goodness, is it ever loud and umami and bright acid and just in your face, like one of these in your face coffees. And Dave doesn't know what I'm brewing. He just grabs, grabs the carafe, pours himself a, a cup, takes a swig of it and goes, oh man, have you tried that? And he's just horrified. Like it's soy sauce. It's, mm -hmm. it's that, that level of fermentation. And then he watches seven of the next 10 people who try it go, oh wow, I love this. This is so good. And then we just sold all of it <laughs> like immediately. And that flavor profile was, was adored mm -hmm. in, in that particular culture where if we served that in Canada, like no one's coming back. No, we're, we lost that customer. They're not coming so back to our shop. Yeah, it's a cultural thing. And uh, whereas this barista competition is a worldwide thing, you have yeah. to address it globally to, to yeah. be understood. Yeah. So, so you have to break out of your, your national mm -hmm. preferences or your cultural preferences and try to, to think to what the global audience is it's going to. It's pretty much the same enjoy. when I had the beam, uh, uh, beans from has been from Indonesia and they were like uh, written on the description uh, rambutan and I was like all right I don't know rambutan, rambutan? my grandmother yeah. didn't grow rambutan here in uh, Romania yeah. so I don't know it but I had some customers who l used to live in Indonesia and they were like yeah it, it really tastes like and I asked them to describe me what's the feeling yeah right. how do I uh, interpret this uh, in info yeah how do I translate it so, yeah, it seems that the coffee was what it's supposed to be, but I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, it's curious it's as well. F flavor notes are tough. So do you adjust the coffee? Uh, depends on where the competition is? We, we try to make flavors. Uh, we don't try to adjust the coffee more so. It's like what, what will locally, if it's a national competition, what locally will people be able to identify it? Like, so... One we've had before is like root beer. And for us, that's like a certain it's a very Canadian thing. Yeah. And so some people are like, oh, I don't know what root beer is. It's like, okay, we got to break this down. Or we had uh, at Worlds, you called for your ice cream or <laughs> for your milk drink, uh, Neapolitan ice cream. So then you explained what that is. And then it's very easy for like the judges to follow through like, oh, it's strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't know what the ice cream is but I know what those three flavors are. So it's a fine balance because mm -hmm. a lot of, we hear a lot of competitors like, oh, that wouldn't work in country A. And we kind of have the belief as it's like, yes and no, like maybe that type of coffee might not do so well, but uh, you, you have to speak, you have to speak the right, I don't know, not language, but like the, the right ideas to the judges without like making too many preconceived notions of what like they think is going to be best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, like this year, we're competing in Korea, but that doesn't mean our judges are Korean, exactly. right? We're going to have an international panel of judges, and odds are there might not even be a Korean on the panel. So we can't tune it to a Korean flavor profile. We really want to keep that international as best as possible an international stance of, of perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of uh, innovation, Aside from the technical part, which is massive now, yeah, the, all the equipments and so on and so forth, how do you see um, the innovation going, like at the farm level, and where do you feel it's like the hub to be in now, yeah, where everything happens and gives the tone, yeah, what's the country, what's the farm, what's the origin, what does it they do they uh, there, yeah, what happens? What are they doing? What are they what putting are they in the water? Mate, yeah, so sugar. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel innovation is going to go in terms of fermenting or processing or yeah? 
varieties. And there are some trends now. For example, the last two-year trend was making blends during the competitions. Yep. Isha with some other eugenides or something. Before that, was were infusions, having one coffee but infuse. So trends, I think. Mm -hmm. We'll still see some blends yeah. all stage. I, I love the blend because the blend is no longer about the coffee. It's now about the barista or the brewer, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's them or their team, the people behind them that are crafting something that is not any singular beverage. That's a story of one person or one farm. They're now taking more than one thing and creating something that probably nobody else in the competition is showing up with. So they're taking a little bit of the approach of like a vintner in the world of wine or a, a master distiller in the world of whiskey where they're, they're seeing each of these, these different coffees as ingredients that have attributes that they want to highlight or mix with something else that's available within their reach to create something that's better than, yeah, than any of them would have been yeah, by themselves. Yeah. And, and dial it for that beverage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can have a milk beverage and then a different dial or different blend for the espresso. And technically they should be the best that way. Will we see this blend uh, transfer to a real coffee shop in terms of, uh, I don't know, we'll see more blends on the grinders in the near future just because in the competitions we started to use blends again? I would hope so. And part of the reason is, is in Brewers this past season, I used a blend and I really loved the blend. I liked the technique. I liked the, the learning and the approach and the playing to get there. Uh, but also in, in what Dave mentioned of us doing pop-ups and different uh, pop-ups and takeovers, bar takeovers, uh, on the filter menu, I would put a blend in every single one. And in every single one, it was either the first or second best selling item on the menu because really? most of the yeah. other stuff on the menu people would look at and the majority of people that are coming are, are coffee people, right? That have, you know, they're seeing a oh, cold Dave Boram, they're in town, cool, let's go get a coffee. And they're looking at the menu and they're like, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. They've got, you know, this farm that I've tried. They've got this farm that I've tried. They've got this farm that I've tried. They've got, oh, the, what's this interesting blend? Mm -hmm. I've never had that experience. Mm -hmm. What's that experience like? And, and all of a sudden there's a signature Curiosity. that's on the menu that's beyond, you know, your cocktail list that's got a Negroni, it's got a French 75, it's got a whatever. Yeah, all the classics there. And yeah, yeah, you got the, the bartender's it. take. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's kind of an iconic, it became this iconic thing through the trip of, you know. But uh, this takes me back a little bit to the Italian culture. They have a lot of blends during... You see descaling. But uh, the blend is happening at a different location. The blend is happening in the roastery. In this case, we're empowering, I think, we're empowering the barista, the brewer, if those are different people, I think they're the same person, but uh, we're empowering the person making the coffee to choose the pathway of flavor. Mm -hmm. This one's got high acid, this one's got great sweetness and texture. What happens if I take eight grams of that and five grams of this and pour whatever my recipe is for mm. water. Of course you're gonna sell it better because it's yours. Yeah, you all, you the, take all, pride sudden, what you did. Exactly. all of a sudden I've got a sales pitch. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I, f I think we'll see, uh, we'll see more and more blends in the next few years. Um, all, one reason uh, is because the coffees are more and more expensive. So probably in order to make them affordable for the customers, yeah. let's say uh, we'll use 30% uh, geisha, then maybe some um, pink bourbon or I don't know, red bourbon or something. And that would make coffee a little bit more affordable for somebody who wants to try the same competition coffee at yeah. home, right? So this might be a reason as well. Mm -hmm. Also, it might create some unique products that can be found only in some uh, roasteries and we will not see any more the same Nestor Lasso coffee in dozens of coffee shops, but we will see different uh, things. So I think could be a good, also good marketing idea. Or we could see a flight. You know, there's a new new line we could do that's coffee A, coffee B, and then the barista's take on the blend of the two. Mm -hmm. So you could try it each individually and then try it all together, like all a together. tasting menu or something. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting to, yeah. to try. 
uh, how, how uh, your usual customer, yeah? Either uh, like a customer from the roastery or the shops that you're having, yeah? How does she look like in uh, Calgary? Because uh, I've read it has one half million people. Yeah, yeah? about 1.5 million. So more than triple than Cluj, no? Somewhere there. Yeah. Uh, what do they want now? I mean, right now, what did, are they asking for? Uh, how That's do they express? What's the Canadian coffee culture? So if we're zooming out to Canada, you know, Canadian consumers, they're interested in, they love coffee, it's our number one consumed beverage, but we consume it more on volume mm -hmm. than maybe consuming it on the best quality. So we have a few brands that we won't name here, but are very iconic in our <laughs> country. <Importance>. And, uh, <laughs> and they're selling just coffee. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what they're promoting. Um, and then if you zoom into specialty, there's a lot of amazing specialty in Canada and certain cities are really pushing the limit. Like the last, you know, 10 Canadian Barista champions, they're all from our city in Calgary. And we would say Calgary's the most dominant. Not know, just in the competition, but also in, in what the companies scene, are yeah. doing. Yeah, like the pushing scene. the limit on. You can, uh, you can get an excellent and above cup of coffee at many different businesses within Calgary. Yeah. You are also entrepreneurs. How do you uh, start it, Rosso? What's the, what was the purpose of the roastery and the cafes? And how the, this brand found its own place into, into the market? How long do we have? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I finished university in uh, 2007 and uh, I was in a different city, came back to Calgary. And I wanted to, I uh, got a business degree and I wanted to trade stocks, which just, really? yeah, oh yeah, it makes me cringe just saying it, but I wanted to trade stocks. <laughs> do, you st do you still do it? Uh, I don't trade Crypto stocks. Crypto stuff? Uh, no, no, I just. You don't, uh, want, you I, don't want to see his portfolio. Yeah, yeah I buy and hold. <laughs> really? <laughs> Hopefully. It's very red. It's all red. <laughs> Rosso means red. <laughs> uh, Where it's not it? a good time for the market. <laughs> <laughs> it's just recovering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's coming back. It just uh, so I came back, wanted to trade stocks, couldn't find a job. Uh, my resume on my resume, it was uh, I did landscaping. I had worked at Starbucks. I'd worked at Tim Hortons and a few other coffee shops. So no one's going to hire me to trade stocks if I've never done it before. And so I started thinking uh, entrepreneurships in in our family's blood. People don't know Cole and I are uh, brothers. And so I was thinking to myself, like, what do I know and love? And what came to my mind was like coffee. In university, I'd go, there was a coffee shop that's still there called Just Us, and I'd go there every day. I'd get my large vanilla latte. Do you still try it? Uh, I, haven't been, I haven't been back to the university town you in should, a long time. Um, I'm just curious what's going to... Yeah, how yeah. that experience would be? Yeah. It's probably, it's in a small town, it's probably the exact same. It would not surprise me. Yeah. Um, and I drink coffee and study, and it became a place for me. It's like the third place. Uh, so I was like, I, you know, I've worked in I've worked in Starbucks, and this is back when Starbucks had Marzocco's, Mazer grinders. We did everything by hand. And when I worked there, uh, frappuccinos had just come to Canada, and people would come in and they wouldn't know what like a cappuccino was. So I'd explain like, oh, a cappuccino is. One third espresso, one third milk, one third foam, like those type of. This the is how. Easiest way, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, so I got this idea. I'm going to open a coffee shop, and there was a bakery where our first location is. There was a bakery going in there, and the bakery backed out, so it was a half finished space. And uh, I talked to the landlord, and the landlord said, "Sure, like if I come with a presentation, will you accept my bid?" And they said, "Sure." So I made a. PowerPoint presentation, I did my uh, cash flow statements, you know, all my business stuff that I learned. My cash flow statements were very, very off. My revenue <laughs> numbers were very, very off, but did those. I uh, did this little presentation. They were like, yeah, that's great. Like, you can sign this lease. So, signed the lease. Eight weeks later, I opened the store. And at this time, it was called Cafe Rosso. And uh, I, I was 24. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I opened the store. I didn't hire anyone. The first day I saw 12 people. So I worked by myself. 
12 people came in. It was also a bakery, so Dave is also doing baked goods. Yes. And yes. this, this mm -hmm. was what year? 2007. 2007. Right. And so, so pretty uh, much the same age as um, each and every crazy person that started at that same 24, 25 years. It seems like that's the age that's the, that's you should the age, start yeah. being crazy because that's if it happens at 40, I think it's <laughs> <laughs> it's alarming. Yeah, it's alarming, yeah. It's a <laughs> and and then slowly over time, it was like 12 people the first day, and a couple of weeks later, it was you know 20. Word of mouth started to spread, and I. Uh, Again, this is old school. There was no YouTube. There was just coffee forums. So when it was slow, I'd go online on my computer, and I would go on. There was a website called Coffeed, and it was a coffee forum. And I would read about uh, Jeff Watts from Intelligentsia and all these like famous people in the coffee industry traveling and buying like single origin coffee. And they had this machine and this grinder. And I quickly realized I knew nothing about coffee. I'd bought all the wrong equipment and I was using the wrong coffee. At the very start, uh, we were using Illy Coffee. Mm -hmm. So that's where Rosso kind of a play on the branding. And so I'm, I'm reading this stuff and I'm looking at my stuff and I'm going, oh my God, like I've screwed this all up. And then slowly over time as it got busier, I'd place their grinder. And then, you know, I had an Electra single boiler espresso machine. I replaced that and I got, at the time I got a Senesso. So we got better grinders. Then I was like, okay, got to upgrade the, you know, roast, like the roasted coffee. So I realized like, okay, there's a difference between freshly roasted coffee and old stale coffee. So I brought in George Howell. So we're brewing George Howell from Boston. And then right around that time we opened a second store and then my lovely brother, is going to now take over the story where you join the business. What a nice intro. The lovely brother, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. really <laughs> uh, I joined the business. I was working in a different place. So you've joined with, when it was like the busiest, yeah? It was like you just no, had to. Yeah, you just came. Yeah, yeah. today, like, man. No, yeah. He came at the high point. We've dying. only gone down from there. <laughs> Uh, so D Dave and I didn't grow up together. So me actually joining the business, we don't need to go into that side of the story, but me joining no, the no, business No, no, we need to was, go in. This is our therapy session. Is this an intervention? Yeah, yeah it might be. <laughs> uh, we, we didn't grow up together. I was working at a different coffee Just shop, and restaurant, so. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't see anybody all day. I kind of sat and did Sudokus all day. I liked making coffee, but I knew the coffee I was making was the shits. Mm -hmm. Like it was not good. We would, I would steam the milk. I worked by myself. I would steam the milk so incredibly hot, all foam, put the milk in the fridge, then extract the espresso and then come back to the milk in the fridge and like scoop, scoop, Thank scoop, you. you know, mountains of cappuccino. Memories. Yeah. yeah. We used to do that just underneath us because I worked here in, there's a big basement. So okay. it's wow. like an Irish pub. Yeah. So I used to do this like. That's, that's how we used to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was and, the norm. And so I, I wrote a resume. I gave it to Dave. Maybe I didn't write a resume. No, that, Probably that's not. That's made up. And uh, <laughs> sort, of, sort of pleaded for a job. He was nice enough to give me a job. I wasn't allowed to make coffee at first. I had to go through the training program as anybody did. And then uh, slowly but surely, this is 2000, late 2009, early 2010. I'm 17, turning 18, and not quite crazy 24 yet. And yeah. uh, we just started to really vibe on coffee, really enjoyed it. We watched uh, Michael Phillips, whenever that would have been in 2010, compete in the World Barista Championship and win. And then wanted to do that and decided to compete that year did the regionals, didn't win, uh, had some stuff happen that we wanted to, to start to roast. We then sat and built a business plan for roasting. 2011, we did our Q grader in Rosebud, Arkansas. It was available in two places in the United States. One yeah, was Los oh, yeah. Angeles, one was Rosebud, Arkansas, which is a town of like 65 people, but one of the instructors <laughs> lived there. Uh, at the time, there was maybe eight Q graders in Canada. Yeah, maybe 30, 40 in the U.S. And, and so we did our, our queue there. And then 2012, 20, late 2011, we got our first sample roaster. I think so. Uh, 2012, we got our production roaster, which is a Probat 12 kilo. The first, first year they came back to, to using cast iron. Dropped it in the back of one of our cafes. Roasted there for eight years. Yep. 
nice. I guess, eight or nine years. And uh, 2012. At this point, we would have had three cafes. Yeah, I helped build one of the cafes, all um, DIY. Just a uh, quick asterisk. How was the coffee scene in the in the city at the point? I mean, did the there, there was kind uh, of competition one, drive one other, you to just yeah one or two other businesses that so were, you were just in a similar one. realm? Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was it was coming up. Like there yeah, was excitement co- yeah. about coffee yeah. and our city, like the average age is 37. So it's like a young, right. vibrant city, like that mountains are an hour away. So people are very active and like coffee is a big part of people's lives mm-hmm. and yeah. very entrepreneurial. The city is like, uh, the city gets behind entrepreneurs. So if it's like whatever Calgary made, people really like support it. So we were like fortunate enough to kind of come up through that, that wave. And when Cole, you know, joined, First, he worked, you know, for Rosso and then joined as a partner. And by 2015, we made the decision like, OK, we've been buying coffee kind of spot. And then we were like, OK, Cole was really bitten by like the coffee bug. So when Cole started, you know, we all have our origin story. Like Cole used to love we have drinks called mochas. It's like hot chocolate with espresso. They're so good. Yeah. And that was like his <laughs> drink. That was his drink every day. You know, you'd have his mocha. And then as time went on, it's like it went from a mocha to a cappuccino and then cappuccino to espresso. And then now it's just water. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> just like water right. anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's fine for me. Do you still remember, guys, uh, which was like the shot that changed everything? Yeah. Uh, yeah, for me, for me, it was George Howell. It was a Pacamara, an El Salvador Pacamara. Nice. nice. And he, like he doesn't it? like this origin story, but it's, it was like a bright acidity, this like chocolate, and then this like fresh tobacco. And I remember that flavor being so unique to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm not a smoker, never been a smoker, but just, just this like intense fresh tobacco and like aromatic, complex slight cedar you know woody mm-hmm. flavor quality like that was the one that was like whoa this what, doesn't what, what, this doesn't like, taste like, like the coffee. taste or did you like the fact that you had you you've put them out there and you've seen the flavors and um you were capable of it was, just, it was so different to what i had ever it, yeah. ever uh-huh. tried and yeah. identifying like identifying, identifying something yeah 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 versus that's, that's, it's like moved beyond it's like oh it tastes like coffee now it's like moved to this like different beverage yes yeah. i remember the very first time we got george howell in and i you know, we had uh, spoutless portafilters, so the bottom cut off, so you could see the extraction. That was a very big and important thing back mm-hmm. then. I remember pulling a shot of Illy, and it would blonde right away, immediately, like old, old aged coffee. And then pulling this George Howell, and it was fresh, and like the the shot pouring down was like this thick, yeah. long thing, almost touching the espresso cup. And I remember like just staring at going like, "What on earth is going on? Like this is so different." And then picking up and there was so much thick crema and then being able to taste something other than coffee and connecting that and going like, wow, we've, so this is all about, this, this, this is, is what everyone online's yeah. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it's here now in my hands. Like, what is, this is like, you know, such a different experience of what we've been tasting in this shop for the last Do two years. Do you still like try to reset your buds with like bad coffee? Let's name it bad coffee. Cause that's what it is. Joe's <laughs> pretty bad now. Do you still do, do you still like go George and still does taste great things. some? Don't you diss George? He's, a, he's an OG. Yeah. Gotta respect the OG. The Godfather. Yeah, that's true as well. I don't know. I've been there. You didn't like it. No. Not but do you still go and taste like Bogdan as well? It's like two a shots of two from, or two. from time to time, just to reset. Because why am I asking? Sometimes it might be really hard for us to. Still evaluate, uh, right. yeah, because right. we we just try to look for defects. Uh, I don't like that, and I don't like that. That's how maybe our mind worked, yeah. So from time to time, I just have to go and like drop a sh- shot of really roasted Italian coffee just to see how lucky I am, yeah, to to work with this kind of coffee. I've been one. How do you do this? Do you, do you still? I've been once in Brazil with uh, Alex, our colleague. And it was this gentleman, Jose, having a farm, a big uh, fazenda. And he made us a coffee. Dude, it was so ter- <laughs> terrible, terrible coffee. But he had to drink it, eh? And uh, it, it, it was made by his wife, actually. It was a combination between tobacco, carbon, ashy stuff. 
Mm-mm. And Alex took a, took a sip and said, hey, he meant, mm. I said, what the hell? <laughs> How can you drink it? <laughs> Damien, it was uh, with us. Damien took the coffee. See the, he saw the first tree. He, he, he was uh, walking next to the tree. Just put it <laughs> next to the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a few minutes later, Jose came uh, to ask, how, how is the coffee? And Alex said, it was pretty good. Said, Dude, I'm letting you here in Brazil. <laughs> I'm, I'm not taking it with me back in uh, Romania. Should have Alex, Alex. Alex can drink any kind of mm-hmm. coffees. Are you those kind of guys that can drink anything? No? Like I, we're I polite can. Canadians, yeah, so I, we probably I, will. If you serve me something that's terrible, I'll maybe sip on it, but I... would I'm not the type that needs a coffee. I'd uh-huh. rather not have a coffee than have a coffee mm-hmm. that's terrible. I see. Like I can go many days without a coffee and I have and I do and that's maybe how I get my reset because I come back and I'm like, wow, this is great. To just take a break. From yeah, I'll just yeah. go three or four days without drinking a coffee where I think Dave has maybe done that once in the last 15 years. I did, I did it on the trip. Yeah, I remember you did it on I the, trip. On the that trip. That was the one time I was referencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how many days? One day. Just one day. And it was I had so bad headaches bad and everything. Yeah. It was terrible. Well, I'll never do it again. No, I think, I think that's, a, that's a smart way to do it. I think also it's tasting. It's a healthier one. Yeah, sure. it's like tasting. You know, we say uh, we'll do cuppings at home and baristas will be like, oh, this is like 81 points. And it's like, no, it's, that's not 81 points. You haven't tasted an 81-point <laughs> coffee. Like, yeah, that's like not our, the baseline. Our team is tuned to a different... Tier. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're used usually to. usually tend to like uh, look only for the good stuff when you when you do cuppings, especially in the beginning. Because uh, I see this now, I, each and every Monday I, I'm making like uh, cuppings with our colleagues, and since they have on the score sheet uh, w- uh, pluses, yeah, where to put the nice things, they don't think about the defects. Mm. So it, uh, coffee tends to be a bit better than it actually ah. is, because that's where you're looking at. Yeah. But if you start educating them or like, I don't know, rose defects or whatever, yeah, they yeah. start to say like, ah, oh, right now I see. So this one is not as good as everybody says it is. Yeah, so um, it's like we, t- we tend to uh, put uh, some limits to Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we, we romanticize the yeah. bad coffees. Uh, <laughs> but we need them. Well, uh, somehow. Yeah. For somehow. Me, for most of the people, whenever they uh, go to try something else, when they can come back, they realize, oh, I, I love this, I miss this. Yeah. And our historical heritage uh, tends to have an important role in the way we perceive, uh, the perception we have on coffee. For example, anytime I'm coming back from a different continent or different trip to our shop or roastery all the time I, I found the coffees very good because mm-hmm. the history I have with those coffees probably for me is having a huge impact on yeah. how I r- I feel like it's the same for you guys because I'm seeing this year I'm resonating with yeah do you like take steps to limit this yeah I think you get familiar or calibrated to your stylistic approach whatever yeah. that might be right and i think for us to go home and taste our coffees would probably be like hmm, yeah these are really good yeah and there's a refreshment and familiarity in that and um de- definitely on like you know we were away for a, well you, you're still away but we've been away a hundred days straight and seeing like you know 12 different countries and their roast styles and like you know how they're prepping coffee how they're extracting coffee it's all similar but different and everyone's kind of got their own style and it's like that's also really refreshing you know we're in china and it's like especially coffee's quite new and they have they have a cafe that's just doing signature drinks and it's like oh wow this is like this is special this is really nice sounds good and it's super busy Mm -hmm. and there's a different take on coffee for us to like explore and see and like be inspired i think let alone the taste, like we've been, you know, inspired by where specialty coffee is going. And there's like, there is a lot of amazing coffee out there. And uh, we got, you know, to experience a lot of it over the last, I guess, five months. And there's also some really interesting history in different places that we would try the local 
Oh yeah, like coffee, coffee, thing. whatever mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. beverage is that people drink. And you some tried them, that? Yeah, we tried to. Anytime some somewhere had one, mm-hmm. like when when we're in Italy, you know, you gotta have an Italian espresso. You gotta go and have the like ristretto. you gotta have a throw a euro at them. They throw an espresso back at you. It clangs on the counter. Like you gotta have that experience. You have to taste. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's the experience that you're yeah. having in. Who's uh, sourcing the coffee now for Rosso? Uh, so it's a mix. I, I do some of it through our other business, Forward Coffee. And then we've also got a, a girl named Amy that's sort of the head of, uh, what is her role? Head of procurement, I, I sure. guess. Logistics, supply chain, something in that sort of category. And, and she's doing a chunk of it as well. I want to throw them under the bus now Uh-oh. with the following question. Uh-oh. Keep prepared for this. You know what? I'm, I think I'm actually uh, my cut. time just yeah. ran out. I think the film, <laughs> the, like, film the team is wants done. to go. Yeah, yeah, they look tired, don't they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's top three? Top no. Top, let's make top five um, most. Um, I don't know. The best producers you're working with. What's top five most preferred producers? Mm. Top five. I said, I said you will t- I'll throw you under the bus because there is definitely a producer on this world to say, Why didn't they call say you? Did you say my name? name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Borem. Fazenda Um, the Um family in Brazil. It seems like an easy gimme. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, no, I, I, think, I think they're really interesting. They have two farms, one in the south of Minas Gerais, one in Espirito Santo. They're investing a ton into genetic research. They have, I think, 40, 45 different varieties that they've planted. Uh, they're doing a ton into processing. They're, they're, they're trying to elevate Brazilian coffee is kind of Boram's big motto and mantra was, was part of his WBC presentation and sort of an underlying approach. And, they're producing some exceptional quality coffees that you could cup and, and go, that's Panama Geisha. What do you mean that's Brazil? Like they, they have complexities and qualities within their cupping, the flavor profiles that you would not expect. Do you expect. have it on forward coffee list? Do you have uh, we have new stuff coming. I think okay. we've just cleaned out. He, he's just finished his crop in Espirito Santo as of December, Excellent. and we've got some coffees coming that are And since he's the first one on the list, I think that, yeah, for sure if, it's going to If there be are roasters that are watching this uh, episode, uh, forwardcoffee.com? Uh, forward.coffee. Forward.coffee. God, so. that's modern. <laughs> exactly. Um, you can check it out yeah, for the new lots of uh, Boramon. Uh, not a very well... We're not very known in Romania, uh, pretty unknown until he won the World Championship, but definitely a farm that you can take a look. A yeah, doing there. some cool stuff. They've got like a varietal called Siriema, which is a, a cross of Racemosa, a different species of coffee with, I believe, Tibica. Cupped it, I don't know, two months ago when we were last together. Genuinely tasted like Panama Geisha. Mm-hmm. Nice. Second or I'm one? maybe just put a Panama Geisha on the table and called it Siriema. I'm just kidding. It's, it's quite nice. Yeah. You go. You pick one. I'm not the green coffee buyer. You are. Okay. I'll keep going then. <laughs> it was so easy. I, yeah. uh, I, ju- I just write the check. <laughs> <laughs> Can you write me a check? No. Absolutely not. Uh, okay. Number two, I'm going to go to Mexico to La Jolla Micro Mill, uh, husband and wife. So Samuel Ronzon and his wife, Gloria Hernandez, she's a PhD in biochemistry. She's doing her PhD in biochemistry and microbiology. Nice. Both? One? I don't know. Somewhere in that realm. And he's a multi-generational agriculture guy that's focusing specifically on coffee. And you go to his farm, it looks like a jungle. It's all bio... um, uh, drawing a blank here. It's all uh, permaculture. permaculture. It's yeah. uh, mm-hmm. following the cycles of, of the moon. It's all integrated uh, with nature somehow. Yeah, it intercropped. He's got a whole bunch of different things planted on the farm that are benefiting soils, benefiting, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And uh, his coffees are, I think, fantastic. I'm, I'm a big fan. They're a super small producer, uh, also available through Forward, Forward Coffee. Um, super lovely family as well 
Uh, what else do we got? I see that you're picking like none of the. I'm trying it, to not like, go to the super like, obvious ones. Yeah, because <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, but they are like more on the, um, the different part of a coffee farm. I know you're looking for something else in coffee, like as you said, the interspecific uh, new variety or what it's called. People who passion, who understands how like nature works. Yeah, and yeah, I, I think doing, ga- like, game ethical. changers in different yeah. approaches of the way they're they're going to. Is this to like production. your, I know, bigger image, like your philosophy on sourcing coffee or connecting with the farmers, or is this? Uh, I definitely like to be connected with with the people that I'm working with, whichever lateral lateral direction that goes. I think it's just that much more. Absolutely meaningful when you achieve something together with somebody that you you have that personal connection with so i mean the um family we've got a great relationship we've met mom dad brothers we we kind of know them all uh sammy and his wife his brother is a big, um, not very good competitor as well yeah mm-hmm. his brother was third Got in the him. world in the brewers cup like no, no. both of them are amazing guys mom and dad are both amazing people stefano and marcia and and so you know we were big fans of them uh the mexico farm uh is it in your list as well for record we will have some coming up soon but i yeah. they produce hardly any coffee they're like 600 kilos maybe of of high-end stuff and then he also operates he's got an uncle and an aunt that own kind of bigger production farms but uh, la joya proper is is a very small small production but uh it it comes onto the menu mostly competition lots yeah it would be it's like in between kind of yeah it's higher end single origins okay yeah but very like they're very good yeah, they'll they'll surprise you for Mexican mm-hmm. coffees, mm-hmm. and they do outstanding, like an outstanding job. All right, and give us a third one. Do we do the obvious one? Like, I don't know. <laughs> You're the What's green the, coffee what is, buyer. What is the obvious one? Anyway? What is yeah, the you green? you have to say Johnson Johnson. You're yeah, having that's, a lot. that's the obvious one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course. But I mean, there's so many. There's what about so many back producers? in Calgary? We're growing. Yeah, that's right. Actually, Dave and I are coffee producers, and we're announcing (laughs) it right here, right now. (laughs) Uh, We've got about six geisha plants back home. How old? Two years? Two years now. Yeah, two and a half years. Must be a few kilos there. I uh, I haven't been home for a while. They might be dead. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, there's there's so many, I think, amazing coffee producers in Panama, like... uh, Kai Jansen and and his family, they're doing some incredible coffees. The consistent the consistency they have throughout the entire portfolio yeah. is just it's mind boggling, honestly. The the quality and consistency they have is is something else. Uh, Justin from Longboard Coffee, another really good friend. He's got three small little farms and the quality he does is uh, exceptional. Mm-hmm. Very boutique, small, small, small scale and compared to Jansen. Uh, I mean, Jose Luttrell, Abu, you guys work with Jose. He and Bibi and his family are, are incredible people. Uh, there's definitely a lot of people we could shout out in yeah. terms of the world of coffee that we were big fans of and Just admire. Just leave them in comments if you feel like somebody's not, uh, I don't know, named yet. Yeah, but don't right. don't terrorize me in the comment for yeah, not absolutely. naming you. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, you're in trouble, uh, man. I'm in he trouble. gave us the list before. There are like... 200 is it's a loaded question okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was just curious about uh, where where do you look look first when you want a coffee for i don't know for a competition for example what what first farms you're looking to so so if i was looking for a coffee com- for competition specifically i think i said it earlier but price is not the driver sca cup score is not the driver flavor complexity is not the driver for me it's it's a linear flavor profile that's easy to identify clear flavors mm. relatively simple in terms of what those flavors are i don't want rambutan you know we're yeah. not going to connect with rambutan it's a cool flavor but we're not going to get it uh something that's easy to identify linear and then has great textural experience if i'm on a cupping table and something jumps out I'm not gonna lock it in in barista on the cupping table. I'm gonna find an espresso machine and I'm gonna pull a shot of it 
because now I'm in the proper domain to actually experience that coffee the way it should be, the way the score sheet kind of says we should, right? I used the analogy on you earlier today that I'm not going to play football with a basketball. Cupping is basketball, football is barista. Switch it around if you want to mm -hmm. switch it around. Mm -hmm. They're different games, and we need to experience the coffee in the realm that we're going to play with it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I would look for a coffee for a competition and and a bit of storytelling. And a bit yeah. of storytelling yeah. definitely And helps. then the barista connecting with it as much as possible, either through like who's producing it or the flavor profile or whatever, but it's equally as important. The, the coffee Boram used for WBC 2023, we cupped probably 150 coffees in Panama. About 100 of them were from Janssen. The one we went with, which was lot number 100, just coincidentally, lot number 100, uh, was maybe the 15th best coffee on the cupping table by SCA standards. Mm -hmm. And there were many other coffees that were what we deemed better coffees. Scored better, yeah. In terms of score, in terms of flavor complexity, in terms of, you know, whatever else. But when we took it to the espresso machine, it was this coffee that was just like the same flavors showed up the way we extracted it. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is so incredibly important for the security of the barista to go out on stage and think, you know, I'm going to get flavors A, B, C today. I'm not going to get four random flavors out of the 15 I've experienced out of this coffee showing up today. I don't want that. Yeah. You want, you want security that those flavors are going to show up. And so that's how we figured out that coffee. And then there were three options that came from his family farm. And uh, it was a pink Bourbon, it was a Siriema, and then it was a Katu Kai 785. They were all good and worthy, but Siriema, we don't have time to introduce a new varietal. So we thought that would be distracting. It was arguably a better coffee than the pink Bourbon. Yeah. But all of a sudden, oh, and I've got this Siriema from Brazil. And the judges are thinking, yeah, you have to explain this yeah, one. What yeah. the fuck is that? It takes time. And mm. we don't have time. Mm. And it's not the purpose of our presentation. So we're not going to go with that one. Katukai 785. Eh, you might know what it is. You might not know what it is. It's a little bit mouthy. The quality wasn't quite as good as the pink per bone, thankfully. So, you know, pink per bone. Oh, it's pink per bone. Cool. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and there was a little bit of a choice that happened there based on familiarity of naming convention. And it also blended well with the, the Janssen Geisha, which was also a critical part of, of all of that. But uh, in both instances, two coffees were not the best coffee that we necessarily had. It was what worked for the presentation specifically. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. But I mean, get Lots there however you want to get there. That was yeah. our approach to getting there. There were other options, other things that we also considered. but. Um, a lot of tasting, lots of trials, lots of roasts, lots of How long Boram trained to get to become World Barista Champion? So he won, he would argue, all of his life. <laughs> <laughs> he won his nationals three times in a row. So his first year he went to Worlds, he came 16th. And then we worked with him in 2022. And nationals, worlds, nationals, worlds. Yeah, yeah. And then he came seventh, and he trained with us in Calgary for a month beforehand. And then he was kind of gutted because the top six obviously moved to the finals. Coming seventh is hard, but uh, had to compete in his nationals in February the following year. In 2023. Yeah, I think he went June 2022 Nationals, September 2022 Worlds, maybe March 2023 Nationals. Yeah. June 2023 Worlds. So within one calendar, yeah, four yeah, two Nationals, time, two Worlds, yeah, yeah. two months in Calgary with us. So it was a lot. It was mm -hmm. a lot of training. Yeah. I have just one more question for you. I'm like the philosophical one. Uh, I don't know if I'm making sense of it, but uh, try to stay with me a bit. I know um, I was thinking lately that um, with all these processing methods and all these crazy coffees, they are good, yeah, but uh, it doesn't give you like the consistency that you said, yeah, from shot to shot. So sometimes, lately, mostly, 
when I'm behind the counter and I'm pulling a shot, I'm not really sure what to expect of that coffee. And I'm not really sure how to, I know, communicate it to, yeah, to my customer. Whereas like six years ago, I would have a natural coffee. I know what I had there. Yeah, I knew okay. how to make it. I knew how to talk about it. Um, and I'm constantly comparing coffee industry with like other industries. Yeah, if I'm looking like in, let's say, soy sauce, soy sauce yeah, they know exactly what they're doing. They have the idea of perfection about how should it taste like, yeah? What should we do about it? Um, maybe in wine and whiskey as well, but in coffee, like, it feels a bit nevrotic now. Uh, we don't have a really good idea about, right, so what's the perfect coffee? It's changing so much, yeah? Uh, if a customer asks me, ask me, so what's the perfect coffee in your opinion? It would be really hard for me to say something, uh, articulate something, yeah? So I'm asking you and feel free to answer uh, where does the identity of coffee lies like right now? Yeah, you're at the top of it. You're defining it. So I, I'm curious, how would you identify coffee now as an industry? It's a complicated one. So take five if you <laughs> I know. Like what is my perfect coffee? No, how would you define how, how does coffee like what's its identity. If another industry asks us, what are you doing, guys? You were coffee professional, yeah? All right, so what do you do? What is coffee? Well, it's, it's, where does its identity lies? I know. Yeah. I think I'm not, a, I, I, for sure, I don't have an answer, but I have the question. Mm. So what would you say about this industry? I think part of the beauty of coffee is the depth of it. So you can consume coffee, just it's just coffee. And it's this beverage for different people. It's caffeine, something that's a ritual that they do in the morning. Um, it's something to wake them up. And then on the flip side, at our end of the spectrum, coffee is also a lifestyle. It's um, Maybe not a religion, but it's something we take very serious and the depths of it kind of, it's a rabbit hole that never ends. And I think that uh, that's like the beauty is like we won't, we, there will never be an end point. We will not solve coffee. It's kind of this formula that will continue on like, uh, I don't know. I can't make the analogy, but we'll continue on forever and we're going to learn more about it, but that unlocks new steps to figure out about it further on. What we're processing now is just like what we were talking about brewing coffee 10 years ago. We'll look back at how we process coffee 10 years ago and now like, oh, those were old methods, old styles, and some are still correct, but some were really not that great and we can improve. We'll do that on roasting. We'll do that on brewing. We're going to do that with, uh, how we s serve coffee. You know, we have new elements of like service that are being created every day and we got to push the boundaries on that. And we kind of, every company and every place, it's like different things are getting pushed at different times. And uh, I think coffee has a fluid character. Yep. It adapts to any environment, any uh, a trend is coming. Yep. Coffee adapts a little yep. bit, takes some stuff from the wine industry, from the cocktail industry, from the food. So it adapts to a lot of things. That's why I, I like to think when I think about coffee, like a fluid shape. Yeah. And part of it would be great to be like, oh, I taste this flavor. I know immediately like, oh, this is a uh, coffee grown from Colombia and the northern region, blah, blah, blah. But there's also something very beautiful. You know, you tested us today. What varietal is this? And we tasted it and we guessed and we weren't close at all. Mm -hmm. And there, there, you know, sometimes that's frustrating because it should be like, we should be able to identify these things. Might be confusing, but you say it's like, <laughs> but it's also beautiful. Yeah, but it's yeah, also, but we realized eventually that yes, that's, that's not the varietal we thought. It yes. <laughs> The transparency sometimes is a major issue between farmers to traders, from traders mm. to roasters. And I think there, there's always 
room for improvement in terms of relationships between that this puzzle yeah. that coffee is because coffee actually is a puzzle and uh, this transparency is a thing that we should work in the future in in terms of varietals processing uh, and sometimes even uh, the, the the how you prepare the coffee Absolutely. you have to be transparent with the customer with yourself uh, okay we can use uh, f f uh, freezed balls but sometimes that may m might be only maybe a marketing and maybe not doing any difference between I don't know maybe it does but sometimes maybe it didn't so uh, if you fool the customer that this tasting coffee is just because you use that frozen ball mm -hmm. uh, I think and with that you just uh, minimize the role of the farmer so what's this, the transparency here it's a long uh, it's chat. like we're yeah, we quite down uh, I know the mood is like uh, pretty down right now and um, okay, I'm gonna spin it a different way I'm gonna give my yeah answer. It's I'll very simple sim like, yeah it's very simple and it's been very much a theme this week I think coffee is family his family. Coffee is family. I love that. It That's is. excellent. You like that? Yeah. Or is it hey, exceptional? Hey, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's exceptional. Yeah. No, I think it's all about the community. It's a vehicle to bring people together, whether that's within the neighborhood, within the family, within different nations that we're talking. You know, it's a mm. global, global audience. And I think the more at least from my experience the more I dive down the rabbit hole the more I connect with like-minded people and and find myself closer to communities of of really beautiful you know like-minded individuals they don't have to be like-minded individuals but I'm meeting all sorts of different people from different cultural backgrounds and a lot of them I would go as far as as deeming them you know family in in a lot of sense I got new brothers sisters fathers mothers wherever out there and you care to about me, the vehicle has been coffee. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, guys, thank you very much for being here tonight. It was a pleasure um, chatting with you about coffee. There are a bunch of other questions we uh, were having in our minds, but I want to let some room for a second uh, round of socks, maybe uh, this year, or next year. But it's always a pleasure having. Um, uh, coffee chat with uh, somebody that knows a lot of things about uh, this industry and uh, it's, it was an honor for us to having you here. Absolutely. I hope you had a good time uh, even if after this long week uh, the energy uh, is lower a little bit but we had uh, a pleasure having you. It's, it's been awesome being here. Thank you so much okay. for, for having us, not just on the podcast, but here in Romania. And I've it's, had a great it's, time. It's, it's been amazing. It's yeah. been, we'll yeah. be back. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. We'll be back absolutely. 100%. Thank you. So um, if you want to hear some other folks talking about coffee, just let us some comments uh, below. Uh, YouTube, uh, I don't know if it's possible on uh, Spotify, but... Uh, if not, just write us on Instagram or other social platforms, whoever we who want to uh, have us here. Um, it was a little bit difficult for us uh, speaking English uh, because you are not familiar with uh, doing a podcast in English, but we did our best. So uh, don't judge us about <laughs> the grammar mistakes we did. Uh, we tried to do our best and... Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed this uh, episode as we did here live. So uh, write us uh, comments below. Thank you, Colleen, for Thanks, uh, hosting Thanks, as well. Thanks, guys. It's Thank you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Always drink good coffee, man. Because it's just coffee. It's just coffee. <laughs> it's just co or just coffee.